you been avoiding conflict lately? Are you afraid that if you speak your truth to someone, you might damage the relationship permanently? Is inner conflict eating you up inside? Maybe you're thinking one thing, but doing another, and you just can't seem to get your head and heart to line up. As humans, we all deal with conflict. Join Jennifer McKenna now as she talks to business leaders about the importance of conflict and how we can all move through it with greater grace and ease, ultimately taking our relationships and our lives to the next level by facing conflict courageously. Well, welcome to the show, Conflict Rising, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are here today to talk about kids growing up in urban America and the truth about their support. Um, and, and so what I, what I wanted to jump in uh, and say about that right away is this show called Conflict Rising, for those who might be new to it today, uh, we talk about uh, cultural issues that cause conflict for us. Um, how that conflict creates internal conflict, whether or not we're able to talk, speak our truth, talk openly, come to peace, move through conflict. So some shows I bring on practitioners to help us with self-care and help us understand ourselves better, and others we tackle some really interesting uh, cultural issues out there that may be causing conflict for us, our loved ones, or others uh, out there in the greater landscape of the country and the world. So today, our topic is about urban America and kids and the support system that they do and don't have. Uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is because my kids are among them. I live in urban Atlanta. Uh, I absolutely love it. I grew up in a small town in southern Indiana uh, that was very culturally bland. Um, no offense. Uh, to anyone out there, <laughs> wonderful people. I loved my upbringing, very loving, nurturing culture, uh, very hardworking, strong uh, work ethic. So I had to work through some of those things that caused uh, problems with my health over time with workaholism, but that's another topic for another day. What I craved as I got older was cultural diversity um, and uh, traveling the world and seeing more of uh, and engaging with people who were from different walks of life from what I was accustomed to. 25 years into this, I moved when I was 25 to Atlanta, and uh, and now I'm turning 50 this weekend. And so in 25 years, I've had the opportunity to raise my own children in an urban landscape, which is very different from my upbringing. And they tell me when we go back to my hometown to visit grandparents, they always come back and say, thank you. Thank you for moving before we were born. <laughs> <laughs> they say that because in today's world, there is a lot of political divisiveness from the different perspectives around the country geographically, and it causes a lot of judgment about racial disparity. And my children um, are in a school where race is equally proportioned, and so um, they live very harmoniously in a very culturally diverse school among their peers, and when they hear these bigger political conversations, it's very disturbing to them, um, and it's very disturbing to, to all of us when we realize that those kids that we love are not being served and not being supported in the way that they deserve to be, and so we uh, make efforts to change that. And so... That's a long-winded way of coming to the topic today with my two very special guests. I have President and CEO of Usher's New Look Foundation, Carisha Moore, and Marvin Logan, who is Usher's New Look alumni, uh, on the show today. So welcome. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Thank you for having us, Jen. Yes. It is my pleasure. Oh, thank you. So we are so eager to talk to you. I'm eager to talk to you. Others are eager to listen to what all the wisdom you have to bring to the table. But can you first, before we go deeply into the con uh, to the conversation and the topic, uh, can you each, we'll start with Carisha if you don't mind, uh, tell us what brought you to Usher's New Look Foundation. What does Usher's New Look Foundation do uh, and why you're here talking today to me? What makes it meaningful to you? So <laughs> it's <Okay>. all yours. <laughs> Absolutely. So I will start by saying that my career journey started um, as an educator. 
in Florida, um, and at the time I taught in Naples, Florida, which was the richest city per capita. In addition to teaching there, I was also assigned to a school in Immokalee, Florida, which I had never heard of, even though I grew up an hour and a half from there growing up in Miami. But I realized quickly the small migrant community um, where our, the students there, even though they're in the, school, the same school district, the disparity, the educational disparity, the resource disparity was just so evident and just smacked me right in the face. The interesting thing about this first assignment was that I was teaching students who were in the gifted program at the time, and they all had to meet a minimum IQ, which was extremely high. Despite the IQ being the same for my students in Naples, as well as my students in Immokalee, I knew immediately that my students in Immokalee would not have the same opportunity. And it wasn't because they didn't have the aptitude or the intellect, but it was quite frankly just the access, exposure, and opportunity due to the disparity in resources. And so from there, I decided that I wanted to dedicate my life to educational equity, went to law school, practiced for a little while, the recession hit, and then, you know, you just kind of get a job doing what you need to do. Um, and so, but it, I did that for a while and realized that my true calling and purpose in life really was to help young people gain access to career and education so that I can do my part in leveling the playing field. Left law practice, did not know what I was going to do, and through a divine intervention, um, a colleague at my job had just gone to a luncheon for Usher's New Look that day, and my literally my last day at the firm, she said, you need to get connected with this organization because they do exactly what it is that you want to do. So I didn't make it a secret why I was leaving. People knew that I was going searching for an organization or a way that I could help to fulfill my purpose in helping young people be successful. Connected with Usher's New Look, volunteered, started doing some curriculum development for them and some programmatic activities, and the rest is history, as they say. So I will tell a little bit about Usher's New Look. Usher's New Look is a 501c3 organization that was founded by Usher Raymond. We just celebrated 20, 20 years this past summer in June, where we've been impacting the lives of youth. We've impacted the lives of over 50,000 youth at this time. Um, and it's a 10-year comprehensive program where we develop young teens and help to transform their lives by leading them into opportunities that where they develop their skills and their knowledge and their experiences so that they then can become leaders and really change the trajectory of their lives. So I found an organization, I always say it's full circle for me, and that this is the organization or type of organization that my students in Immokalee needed. And then with that, I'll let Marvin sort of tell his story because he actually participated in the program and is an alumni today. That was a great lead in, Carisha. Um, uh, my name is Marvin Logan, and I hail from a small city called Warren, Ohio, uh, in Northeast Ohio, where um, football, deal, and God you know, rule everything. And uh, we truly live by the mantra that Nothing is given and everything is earned. Uh, I was raised in a single parent household. Uh, my father uh, raised my sister and I. Uh, he, he, he worked and retired from GM. Um, and we pretty much saw the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, when, when the industry was booming, uh, we were doing very well. Uh, and while we lived in a, a poor community, uh, I would say that we were able to live comfortably. Uh, and then after the uh, economic crash and the bankruptcy uh, of General Motors, uh, you know, we lived a life that was pretty much night and day, uh, where my father went from making eighty to $90,000 a year to twenty six. And so uh, with the school district uh, that we lived in, uh, it was very possible that uh, you could walk into any classroom and you would have uh, students who were second, third generation, second, eight housing government assistance. Uh, and on the other side of the classroom, uh, you have students who grew up in the state uh, with families who are very wealthy and influential. So you had a, a, a lot of mixing of the pot, as they say, uh, with a lot of different groups of, of people. 
uh, for myself as a, a young African American male, you know, I had a lot of dreams, and my father raised us to believe that we could be anything and everything that we wanted to be. Uh, but I wasn't sure uh, what a pathway uh, to, to achieving those dreams were. Uh, so in comes an opportunity for me to uh, take a flight to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and attend a seminar, uh, which I did. And uh, while at that seminar, uh, I met Mr. Arthur Raymond, who's been with you know, Arthur's New Look for 13 years ever since. Uh, I was able to uh, go through new programmatic service models that we've seen over the years, um, participate as an academy student. Uh, I attended Kent State University. Uh, while there, I was in a moguls and training program, uh, which is a program for students uh, post academy or post high school. Uh, that really teaches us how to hone in on our skills and talent and, and devise a plan so that we can take our education and the things that we're passionate about and, and make a positive difference in our community. Uh, and after injuries derailed my athletic career, uh, I was able to use that service education that do me uh, and dedicate my life to student leadership. Uh, I became the student body president at Kent State and, and have continued to serve individuals ever since. Uh, I had an opportunity to start my professional career uh, with Arthur's New Look for my first two years uh, out of college. Uh, then another nonprofit organization that served the students that we're on the show talking about today. Uh, and then this uh, past year, I was able to start my own company that focuses on the education, sports, and entertainment uh, that uh, creates opportunities to engage and expose uh, our local communities to opportunities for us to continue to close the gap for young people in education. So um, New Look certainly uh, built a foundation for me uh, when I first became a student in New York, I thought that I, I hated children and I would never have anything to do with education. But what it really did was uh, – provide me an experience and a pathway to where I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to. Fantastic. You know, you both are sharing such important information, and I know that in today's show, I'm calling in remotely from Los Angeles. You all are in Atlanta, and I think you may be in the same room, and we're getting a lot of feedback. Is there any chance that you're on speaker? So we're actually separate. Uh, in Separate locations now, but I did take mm-hmm, I did take uh, my phone off speaker. Okay, so I don't know what so the feedback is. Help. Hopefully, yes, that would be great because there are certain parts of what you're saying that are hard to understand, and I know everything you're saying is so important. I don't want listeners to miss out on it, so I'm sorry I, I took that minute to just <laughs> interject that, just in case there's anything we can do. I can't see everyone, which is hard um, to know what's right. causing that. But thank you for for that adjustment, and hopefully the producers can pick up on anything else uh, behind the scenes that we can clean up a little bit with that. So, so Carisha, with where you started, and then it sounds like Marvin really kind of brought it to life with his own experience, is the, the differences in the resources. And so this, to me, is the tricky part of the conversation because in the political discussions, in the greater landscape, in these bigger, more conflict-inducing uh, discussions, there is a component associated with the resource dispar- disparity um, related to race. Did you experience that? Do you think that's fair? And why do you think that correlation exists? Well, I think that people, you know, a lot of our political leanings may start from very young, you know, and then we we are poured into and we sort of, you know, start to group ourselves and become even more homogenous based upon our thoughts. That's just, you know, nature in most cases, and people tend to do that. And so the thoughts that we have and the, the, the thoughts that we develop about any group of people or things or food or music you know, we, and in this case, race, a lot of that can be shaped by our own experiences. Well, if your experiences are pretty much, um, you know, very different from other groups, whether it's religious or, or race, then you may not be able to empathize. You may 
um, stereotypes based upon things that you may have heard in the media or from other people in your peer group, and you never really come to terms with, you know, the thoughts in this case re regarding racial disparity as to why these things exist. You may just take it as, oh, you know, these people can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They can find their own resources. They may not just, they may just not want to, you know, just based upon what it is that you sort of immerse yourself in. And I, that goes to, you know, just my own thought is that we as humans, we don't take the time in, in many cases to empathize or even to get to know other people and know their plight because I truly believe if we did, we could understand better and in most cases that could urge people to take action versus just sort of coming up with these theories that are completely unfounded, uh, which mm -hmm. can lead to behaviors. Um, and, and, and then in this case, what we see is disparity, discrimination, and then you have people who may rise to power who may be able to bring about change or allocate resources, and they don't because they really don't understand the systemic issues or the issues related to the disparity. So there's no empathy, there's no understanding for why certain resources may be needed or even why more research resources may be needed in one area as opposed to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is where, you know, when I opened the show talking about the geographic differences in perspective, I did that because I have spent equal portions of my life uh, in different areas where the cultural um, uh, background and the 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 racial mix is are it, polar opposite, very different. Um, and as I've grown older, my my perspective has shifted so dramatically because of it, and that's why I become so passionate about talking about these things and why I'm so grateful that the two of you have come on to do so. So we're gonna take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I wanna continue the conversation about uh, the work you're doing and, and why these kids need so much support and how we can do that. How can we provide better support? So stay tuned everyone, we'll be back. Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Own Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Connect at ohmtimes.com. Ohm Times, creating a more conscious lifestyle. I'm Kathy Williams, host of Sexy Mom Abundant Life radio show on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. On the show, we explore living abundantly in every area of your life. Ways to let go of limiting patterns and beliefs and to step into the flow of creativity and possibility knowing you are supported by the universe. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. So I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDCP. Welcome back to the show, everyone. We're here talking to Caricia Moore, who's the CEO and president of Usher's New Look Foundation, and Marvin Logan, who is a proud alumni of the program. So welcome back, everyone. Before we went to a commercial break, I was sharing um, that how my perspective has changed and broadened and deepened, and I've become much more educated and empathetic as I've gotten older because of my exposure to different uh, regional differences in belief systems and support systems and uh, cultural uh, uh, diversity. And, 
You know, I think that uh, there are a lot of people in areas of the country who have uh, certain opinions, judgments, or beliefs based on, to your point, Cretia, things that maybe either they were exposed to, you know, once or twice, or they've heard, or somebody else planted the seed, you know, but they haven't really lived it. Let's just say that. They haven't really lived it. And so, um, so it's just misinformed. Um, and it's very difficult to have a conversation with someone who is very set in their belief system and they don't realize they're misinformed because they're so passionate about their beliefs. <laughs> and I say that right. because it's a lot of people from my upbringing. <laughs> and then it just becomes a very divisive conflict inducing conversation instead of a productive one where we can truly create positive and proactive change. And that's why I wanted to do the show. I'm hoping that our conversation can help to enlighten and empower those listening to help us make a difference and a dent in that very old, uh, very worn out um, discord. So, so I'm not necessarily trying to make this about race. I think what I just want to make sure we do is include it in the conversation because others um, are uh, – maybe doing that in a way that is further exacerbating the problem instead of helping us create these great support systems. So given that, talk to me about your experiences firsthand. Uh, what communities don't have the right support system? What support system are they missing? And where you come in to try to fill that gap. I will let um, Marvin respond to that, having, you know, participated in the program. With, and I'm thinking, Marvin, perhaps the support systems that you felt like you had and those that now that you are, you know, a successful young adult that you think could have supported you even, you know, more. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that if you are, are, are viewing the 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 roots of the issue uh in terms of geographic location uh gender and race uh you have to you know start with empirical data uh you know you talked about how people are are passionate about the things that they're misinformed about uh one of the things that makes it possible for us to do the work that we do uh is by uh fighting misinformation with information with with uh, well-mined data uh, that that tells a story. Uh, and I think you have to consider uh, historically uh, things that created these gaps in the first place. Uh, uh, an African-American child doesn't wake up in the morning and is naturally uh, not as intelligent as anyone else. Uh, um, a Latino-American child uh, doesn't wake up and, and have a different type of, of, of work ethic than everyone else. Uh, you you look at things like the history of uh, redlining and banking practices, uh, the uh, violence towards black and brown bodies, and, and how those things help create the achievement gap. Uh, I would be willing to bet my last dollar that if you look across America and you look at struggling school districts, uh, you will see a correlation in data of both uh, home ownership and tax revenue uh, from the income that is pouring into the community from the working people there. Uh, those gaps have continued to get bigger, and those greatly affect the need of support that students who are growing up in those communities need. Uh, I, I remember my own story that has really come full circle, uh, you know, growing up. Had I not been a, a star athlete, I'm not sure I would have been able to get to college. Uh, and then had I not made the connections that I made, I don't believe that I would have been able to stay in college and graduate. Had I not had an usher's new look, uh, I can't promise you that I would, you know, have a degree and, and been able to pursue my higher education. When you are dealing with large populations of students 
who are first generation college students or even first generation trade school students, you realize, you know, the circle of people that surround this student, the majority of them have either never been in this situation or never been able to complete uh, this opportunity from start to finish. Uh, so there's not a lot of information in the home. There's not a lot of information in the community uh, that can help guide them through the process. Uh, I consider things like summer notes or verification notes, where you have a student who, who gets good grades, they fill out the FAFSA form, uh, they apply to school, they're accepted to a school, and they're ready to go. Uh, a lot of colleges and universities uh, can't really cover the minutia of things that helps get that student all the way through. A student who experiences summer melt is a student who uh, applies and is accepted to and declares intent to attend a college. But for whatever reason, when the fall rolls around, that student is not enrolled in school. So many different things within that student's support system, whether it be transportation, whether it be money to handle the fees, um, it could be the fear of a parent with filling out the FAFSA form. Uh, it seems now, uh, over the past several years, uh, families have had to do more and more just to prove how poor that they are so that they can get uh, financial aid from the federal government. Uh, and this largely impacts students of color who do not come from uh, economically strong backgrounds. And I, I think about how those things began to affect me uh, when I was going through college and, and as uh, I continued through and the process became more and more difficult, how many times I had to be pointed in the right direction, I had to make the, the right call, and, and I was lucky because I was an athlete and then I was a student leader. So I always knew directly where to go, and I promise you the, the majority of students that I served didn't. And it was a, a big part of our mission to make sure that we relay that information uh, but so many of those students don't get connected with those types of resources. Also, the academic achievement gap is uh, the worst that it's ever been. Uh, we have students who are, are entering high school with, uh, you know, fifth grade reading levels or worse. Uh, we are living out the, um, you know, the damages of no child left behind. Uh, where we're graduating, uh, where we're pushing through students who don't have, uh, you know, marketable, employable skills. Uh, we, we've created parents with reading deficiencies, and now we have children with reading deficiencies uh, who struggle in math. And, and those are the type of support systems that our students today need. Uh, and often uh, for a student who wasn't in an Usher's New Look, who wasn't in a Boys and Girls Club, who has been struggling with math, reading, and their social sciences since they were in middle school, and yet they continue to progress to each grade, uh, they are continuing to fight a more and more uphill battle. And if there's no one around that student in the home who's able to support that academic progress, uh, you, you get someone who's in a classroom, they feel out of place, they feel forgotten, they feel invisible, uh, and often it leads to behavioral issues when you don't have to, you have someone who's not a bad kid, you just have someone who's literally been left behind and feels out of place, and there are not support systems in place to help bring that student uh, back to where they need to be. So those are the types of, of gaps uh, that we're talking about, we're, and we're talking about them at different levels, whether you have a decent student who is trying to move on to the next step, whether you have a student who has finished undergrad but has never been uh, exposed to the opportunities of an advanced degree, or you have someone who's in high school and uh, it just doesn't, hasn't been given the skills for them to be successful. You have various places where there are, are, are achievement gaps, there are wage gaps, there are performance gaps, that there are not enough support systems set up to make those students successful. And I'll just jump Excellent. in on that as yeah. well, um, Marvin. That, those are all great points that you brought up. But when you look at particularly economically disadvantaged students, the graduation rate is below the national average. So that's the national average is 80%. And those, when you segment out race or when you segment out 
um, you know, location or zip code or whatever, that those dramatic those numbers dramatically decrease. So then the number goes to less than 70% for those students who are actually enrolling in college and less than 60% for those who persist and graduate. Again, it's not an aptitude or an ability issue, but it is what you bring up, Jenna, is the support and the resources that are around them. Um, when you, you mentioned this about parents, you know, uh, Marvin supporting them and who may not have an ample education themselves, well, I think that's where supports need to be provided and that it, we're supporting parents. You know, some people have the thought, and I've had these conversations where they think everything that a, that a youth or a teen or a child receives should come from home. Well, I subscribe to the notion that it takes a village. And when that home is lacking resources due to a parent trying to make ends meet, maybe working two jobs, or maybe, you know, like Marvin talked about, working in an industry, complete industry, especially in a small town, leaving and leaving that parent with less than half of their income to support a family, you know, there are some things that are going to be lacking in there, but that's where those supports um, to need to come in. You know, I always think education is not just reading, writing, and arithmetic, but it is providing those skills and competencies that youth need so that when they grow up, they can access um, the opportunities that the same students on the other side of the track, so to speak, will have access to. Those same skills and knowledge, the knowledge base that they receive as a part of their regular school curriculum. I'm talking about networking, communication skills, soft skills. Those sorts of things that employers will be looking for, that colleges will look for when they're interviewing students. So when you talk about what supports need to be provided, I think it's all of those things that people think are the extras or the luxuries, but for youth, especially youth coming from lower income areas, they become a necessity, you know, and I truly believe that those skills should not just be provided to students from a certain zip code. And so that's what we at Usher's New Look provide. You know, we're not, it's not math tutoring, it's not reading tutoring, but it is providing those skills through our three core programs um, that Marvin talked about. It is exposing them to entrepreneurship and, you know, how to create a resume and networking skills and introducing them to various careers um, even outside of those that they may see on t on a day to day basis, and I think investing in organizations like Usher's New Look more and more is important because we're helping to fill that gap. School systems and schools can only do so much because they're over tested, um, underfunded in a lot of ways, understaffed. So it's important that an organization like ours can come side by side with a school and partner with the school district to help make up those gaps that are that are necessary. Because what we know is that when students learn these things and they identify what it is that they're passionate about, it's just new look, we start with the spark. What are your gifts and talents? We get students to start to think about that and really to do some discovery around that and then tie education and career to those spark, those self-explored sparks. When you get a student who's identified what it is that they're good at and that they truly have gifts and talents, what we found is that confidence goes up, their, you know, the education that they're receiving all of a sudden becomes relevant because it connects with something for them. It's not a short-term game, but they start to invest in, okay, where do I want to be in the future, you know, have a stronger future orientation, and they're able to craft a journey for themselves. And that's where you see the trajectory change um, in the students that we work with. Yeah, that's fabulous. I love all of what you've both said, it's really, really powerful and multifaceted. And, you know, I, well, I want to go back to, to something that Marvin brought up right when he began speaking, which is, you know, the African-American child <clears throat> that wakes up in the morning is no less intelligent uh, than any other child. Uh, the Latino uh, or Hispanic American child is, is no less um, able to or desiring of working hard, I'm, I'm probably botching up the way you said it so eloquently. But the point is, is that yes, starting from the premise that all children have the same potential. Now they all may have different um, learning potential and so forth. If there are learning disabilities involved in any segment of society, uh, it's not you know as though everyone was made exactly the same. But 
uh, all these kids have the same potential. And we have to really care about that potential. Uh, the most thriving communities are the ones where ac uh, resources are accessible and plentiful, um, where everyone across the board, no one is suffering to the point where they need to commit a crime to get their basic needs met. You know, if these are kind of basic fundamentals of of, of life and, and prosperity, but um, but we miss we miss the boat on it oftentimes. One of the things that you know I brought up in the beginning about the geographic differences that I wanted to just call attention to is that I do think there are because a lot of the work that I do is cultural. I do a lot of culture change in, in corporate America, and and uh, culture has a lot to do with behind the scenes uh, what the belief system is and the behaviors that come out of that and so forth. And to change a culture, those things have to change. And so geographically, I see a lot of different belief systems um, that cause certain judgments. And, and the reason why in the beginning I talked about the hardcore work ethic of the Midwest where I was raised, um, I do think that where it plays out is when people are sitting in one area of the world and they're looking at the problems in another area of the world and um, and they're making a judgment about it. You know, if someone was raised to think that you just work hard and solve all your problems, then they just make the assumption that someone else must be lazy. <laughs> right? right? I laugh because it's not that simple, but this is how these beliefs can be formed. Mm -hmm. And so just on a personal note, um, I went through uh, a situation where I got divorced. Uh, at the same time that the economy uh, crashed, and I, of course I didn't know that the economy was about to crash. <laughs> My ex-husband and I might have re rethought that at the time, <laughs> retrospect. But the point is, is that it became a perfect storm. I was diagnosed with breast cancer right after that. I was self-employed. Um, I was starting my entire material world from scratch at that point. I had two small kids in tow. And, uh, and so my whole world came crumbling down. When I was uh, truly without resources um, and I was forced to take my kids and stay with a friend because we were homeless at one point, um, I have never in my lifetime, and I already admitted I'm a recovering workaholic. I can work hard mm -hmm. as the day is long. I've never, ever worked as hard to get little to no results as I did when I had nothing. Mm -hmm. And I used to say to people all the time, this is the hardest work any human being could ever have is to be to have no resources. And so anyone out there who may have ever made the correlation between laziness and a lack of resources needs to just completely obliterate that belief system. There's nothing further from the truth. <laughs> I have lived it. Um, right. And so I think it's super important. Uh, the work that you're doing. Um, we're going to take another commercial break. When we come back, I'd like to talk more about what it is that you really do uh, specifically and where you are bridging those gaps. And uh, Marvin, you, you have a great success story. So stay tuned, everyone, so we can hear more from Carisha and Marvin. Free your mind with Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. 
Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone. We're continuing our conversation with Gracia Moore, the president and CEO of Usher's New Look Foundation, and Marvin Logan, who is a proud alumni. And uh, so we've been, you know, on all of my shows, I kind of like to talk about the problem itself and and, uh, breaking it down and and talking about what may be causing it and so forth. But I really like to end the show with solutions-based thinking. Um, And that's what the organization, Usher's New Look Foundation, is all about is providing solutions to this really grave problem that we're seeing. Um, Marvin, you did a great job earlier of talking about um, some of the uh, growing statistics that are really troubling in terms of the support that some of these kids have. Um, and so, Caricia, I know, you know, you've seen from from what you've shared um, when you're in the school systems uh, that are very privileged and when you've been in the school systems that have no support system. So it must be extremely gratifying to do what you do today. Can you walk our listeners through uh, kind of a day in the life? What does this look like? What does the foundation do literally on the ground? Absolutely. So our program is based on a peer-to-peer model where our students, like Marvin was in college, actually uh, turned around and trained other young people. So we work with youth ages 14 through 22, and our program has three core distinct um, aspects to it. One is our Powered by Service training, which is a one-day training. Think of it as sort of an assembly on steroids about four to six hours, and we will go into schools with our college students who have been trained to deliver this curriculum where students leave out with such confidence and just knowledge about their skill set and how they can apply it to not just impact their lives now, but also in crafting a better future for themselves. And so that day looks like those students learn about networking. They learn about how to advance their personal brand financial literacy, how to use their talents and gifts to impact their community, um, and leadership. And so they receive a certification, and all of our curriculum, Jen, was written in conjunction with Emory Goizetta Business School. So it's been highly researched. We're looking at what students, first-generation students, urban students, those students who are coming from um, under-resourced areas, what it is that they need in order to be successful. So that's our Power by Service training. We also have a leadership academy where students in ninth through 12th grade can participate in this program where they're meeting for four hours per month. And again, they are focused on our four pillars, talent, education, career, and service. So each year they do a deep dive through engaging curriculum, um, developing relationships with their cohorts, and really understanding how do I hone my talents and gifts? That 10th grade year, they're focused on financial literacy and education and really crafting whatever that post-secondary plan looks like for them. I often tell students and others that I work with, very few of us are able to graduate high school and be ready to take on the world. So regardless of what you need, you're going to need some more education to support and to be as successful as you can be. Um, And then that junior year, it's career readiness, so resumes, mock interviews, career exploration, where we bring in people from all sorts of careers to talk about how they got to their position. Um, We work with a partner, Stepping Blocks, where students are able to go on this platform and really look at people who are in position, say I'm a young student and I think I want to do marketing, I can locate marketers and see what their career trajectory has been. And then that senior year, the focus is on service. You know, Usher, when he started the organization, was very passionate about you using their leadership to better their world. And so that 12th grade, they're learning about philanthropy. They're learning about the global issues um, where they will soon be, you know, everybody said, I believe the children are our future. Where this truly is the future that's going to right the wrongs and bring about the solution to help to bring about a better world. And so that's our high school program that we have in Atlanta as well as in New York. 
And then thirdly, we have our college program, which Marvin spoke to earlier, the Moguls and Training Program. 86% of our students are first-generation college students. And so what that means is they may have everything that they need to get to college, but we know historically and the research says that they may not necessarily complete those first 24 credits and be able to persist to earn that degree. So we provide support with for them through a virtual program where they're learning about things, as, you know, it could be time management, you know, study skills, how to develop relationships with professors so that you can begin to network all the way to why is in internships, why are internships important, study abroad, budgeting, and then preparing for transition into career. So that's our program in a nutshell. We've been we're so grateful to have some amazing partners. SunTrust Foundation, Travelers, FedEx, and so many others that help support the work that we do and provide that exposure for our young people. You know, I have to quote, um, there's a gentleman, Harvey Coleman, who came up with a theory called the Pi Theory, where our success in life is 10% about performance, and there's 30% about image, and then 60% with exposure. And that's what we do for our students. It's providing that exposure that they need you know, providing them the opportunities for things that they may not see. You, I mean, you're here in Atlanta, Jen, you live here, and we work with students who may not have ever been outside of their zip code, or we work with students in another metro county who may not have ever come to downtown Atlanta. So we take for granted that just because people have cars and we have public transportation, that these young people can go out and get exposed, but they are not. And so that's what we do to make sure that they, we're building the confidence that they need to be successful. It reminds me of a young student that I was teaching when I was in Immokalee. Now, mind you, these in Naples and Immokalee, again, were in the same school district. Um, but I knew immediately my students needed more in order to support the talents and the gifts that they had. So we did a, a service learning component. And the students decided and they voted and they worked together to create a mural idea for the school. And it was a positive mural, mural that they thought would help to inspire the other students at the school. So I found a mural artist who donated her time, donated the resources, but the only thing was that we would have to come on a Saturday to, com to complete the mural. And the young man who wanted to be an artist, who actually drew the design and got the input from his fellow classmates, he came up to me and he said, Miss, I will not be able to come on Saturday. And I said, well, why? You know, you came up with this this idea is going to be on the wall and you'll get to actually work with an artist. And he said, well, I have to work with my family in the field on Saturday. I'm not allowed to do anything else. So when you talk about that exposure, here it is a young man who wants to be an artist, who has the opportunity to work with an artist and see his own art come to life. But because of lack of resources and the fact that his family would make more money, the more people from their family that could work, he was unable to take advantage of that. And to me, that's where, you know, we have to just be more cognizant and more intentional with our youth. And that's what we do at UNL is working to give them those exposure points and helping to reduce those barriers. You know, our program is free to our participants because we don't want any barriers to the students gaining what we know will um, level the playing field for them and their success. Yes, and level the playing field, and then over time break the cycle of Absolutely. a lack of support, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. once they go out there and become a, a force within the workforce and uh, increase their socioeconomic status and per be able to provide resources to their family, I mean, communities, that's how we create these prosperous communities and break the cycle, and I think that's just huge. So you've got the short-term impact on the individual and the long-term impact on the community. It's fabulous. Marvin, as a recipient of all these great things, can you tell us um, what, what would you say about your experience? Is there anything, a profound moment you had, a particular takeaway? Um, what would you like to add to what Caricia shared? I think the significant uh, takeaway for me, uh, Usher's New Look has had a, uh, a partnership with Coca-Cola for many years. Uh, and when we had the opportunity to uh, tour uh, Coca-Cola headquarters in Atlanta, there was uh, an African-American woman, and I cannot recall her name right now, but I know that she is still with Coke, 
Um, she said that you can't be what you can't see. And coming from uh, the Mahoning Valley uh, in, in Northeast Ohio, I never got the opportunity to see uh, major levels of success up close and personal. Uh, and, and my very first interaction with UNL, um, a- after the, the seminar was over in Milwaukee, I thought to myself, I may never get the opportunity to, to meet uh, a, a, a mogul and an entrepreneur like Usher Raymond. And I just walked up to him and spent 20 minutes talking to him. And, and, and you know, we didn't really talk about music. We talked about life and we talked about entrepreneurship and success. And I think for uh, young people like myself that come from my background, uh, entrepreneurship is our gateway to the world. And so to be able to to have that kind of experience and then be able to take that conversation into a 13-year relationship uh, where I would have the opportunity to to grow and and, and see what I was trying to be and be exposed to all types of opportunities so that I could live out and fulfill my dreams. Uh, But most importantly, put me in a position to impact the lives of the young people that are around me so that uh, now they can see that type of success that I wasn't able to be exposed to. Uh, It's been a a tremendous impact on my life. It's been a tremendous impact on my community. Uh, And as long as I continue to live, I know it will be an impact on the world uh, because I want to share with young people those types of opportunities, uh, whether you are a middle schooler, a high schooler, uh, someone in college who is trying to take that next big step uh, towards their goals and ambitions. Uh, I just want to be a conduit for that success. Uh, my wins are their wins. And so I wouldn't have had those opportunities uh, had it not been for Usher's New Look. Uh, and it's it's been a great ride and it's been a great experience. And I look forward to continuing uh, to 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 have the relationship and to be able to make an impact and for me to be able to continue to learn and grow. And Jen, if well, I, I add, guess, I mean, yeah. Marvin is just Please. one just one of these success stories, right? I mean, there are countless others. And when I just, I just have to say this, we talked about the impact in the world, you know, in their communities, but we're also talking about impacting their family for generations to come, you know, breaking mm-hmm. that generational poverty cycle in a lot of, ways where we still have students whose parents have not graduated from high school. And not only are these students graduating from high school, they're graduating from college, and then they're going on to work for Fortune 100 companies or like Marvin, starting their own business and really figuring out how to leave their footprint on the on the world, which to me, it, it can just change the complete landscape of a family um, if we get down really granular to it as well. Yes. And, you know, and I think about, you both brought up Usher. Uh, obviously, he started the foundation. There are many of you who are invested and have carried that torch forward. And I think the one impact this one man has had, not just through his music, um, which, by the way, side note, can I just say, Usher has had an impact on me as well in the sense that I've been through multiple medical uh, traumas in my life since childhood and, and beyond. And I am now the physically strongest I've ever been because I finally joined a gym at the age of 48. In the last two years, I've been focusing on that. My coaches know this is a fact. When I hit a wall and I don't think I can make it, they just go put Usher's music on. Wow. <laughs> and I breeze right through the rest That's of it. Powerful. And we all high fives at the end. <laughs> It's a huge, a huge for me. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's a huge victorious moment, um, and I never, never fail to make it through because of that. So, um, so, but my point is, I want to leave everyone with the idea that they too can make an impact. Um, because I look at Carisha, what you've done with your career, Marvin, what you're doing with yours, um, how Usher did it with his career, and then went on to start this to allow for you all. I mean, the ripple effect of how each of you has individually made a conscious and intentional decision to make a positive impact beyond yourself, that's the call out I want for our listeners, that this isn't an issue that is just over there. This is something everybody can do. And so I guess our parting words, I'm just going to ask, what would each of you say to listeners out there that they could do 
to make an impact on this particular situation? For me, I would say start with one individual. You know, if you can make an impact in one individual's life, that, like you said, Jen, can have a ripple effect. You know, we're in the age where, you know, movements and people think things have to be big and grandiose. No, you know, just making an impact in one child's life, one person's life can be huge. And then the other thing is challenging individuals to get to know people who are different from them. You know, um, it, you don't have to stay. I know it's more comfortable sometimes, but I think getting out of your comfort zone, having conversations with other people, going to other cultural experiences so that you can start to speak from experience versus what someone else has poured into you um, can really help to take our human race to a different level level and break through some of those barriers we talked about earlier um, in the show. Fantastic. Marvin, parting words for the listeners. Uh, I would paraphrase a quote from Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to be not. Uh, so no matter what you do, be engaged in your community uh, and you will be able to make a change in the I want to thank you both for being on the show. Really deeply appreciate your input. And thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you next week on Conflict Rising. Take care. 